good afternoon. I'm Ingrid Munson, professor of music in African and African American studies, and it's my great honor to introduce Herbie Hancock this afternoon, who will be giving his third Norton lecture. Before I begin, I want to thank Mr. Hancock for generously engaging with our students in these past few weeks in ways that have been utterly transforming for them. Every moment they have spent with you has given so much joy and inspiration. In his first two lectures about Miles Davis in Breaking the Rules, Mr. Hancock chose to honor his mentors and teachers, showing us how Miles Davis's wisdom, Chris Anderson's harmony, and Eric Dolphy's too out to be in and too in to be out music inspired him to find his own very productive path of rule breaking and musical creativity. Mr. Hancock's spirit is so large and generous that he left out the fact that his own explorations in harmony, composition, and improvisation utterly transformed the post-bebop musical landscape in profound and influential ways. Those paths of harmony he showed us on the piano last time didn't exist before he developed them. And when he put them into improvisational action within the community of other fellow explorers like Wayne Shorter, Miles Davis, Freddie Hubbard, and Buster Williams, the music soared. He would likely say, He's not here to talk about that. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but rather the ethics of jazz, the power of music beyond the greatness of its heroes to seek freedom, justice, compassion, and ethical understanding. For jazz always has had a message that is as contagious as it sounds, the message of dignity, diversity, freedom and moral conscience. I'll repeat, a message of dignity, diversity, freedom, and moral conscience, which transcended any of the personal failings of its all too human artists. Musicians were seen as cultural ambassadors as early as the 1930s when they played abroad to rapt international audiences. The State Department in 1950 sent people like in the 1950s sent people like Dizzy Gillespie abroad as jazz goodwill ambassadors to help in Cold War era diplomacy. Although the government sought to harness the music for its own purposes, the musicians always pushed the envelope, knowing that jazz had a message that could not be contained. Herbie Hancock has become one of the foremost carriers of the jazz message today. In 2011, he was named UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for the Promotion of Intercultural Dialogue. His participation in UNESCO led to the establishment of International Jazz Day, which celebrates the music as a vehicle for promoting peace, intercultural dialogue, and human rights. International Jazz Day is April 30th and was first celebrated in 2012. Through his work with UNESCO and his collaborative musical endeavors like the Imagine Project, Mr. Hancock has drawn attention to the enduring jazz message in humane and captivating ways. His lecture today is entitled Cultural Diplomacy and the Voice of Freedom. Please join me in warmly welcoming Herbie Hancock. <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome all of you to week three of my Ethics of Jazz lecture series, and my heartfelt thanks for joining me this afternoon. Over the past two lectures, I've discussed the wisdom of Miles Davis, the pros and cons of breaking the rules, and in the process, I think you've gotten to know more about my life in and out of music. I've enjoyed getting to know many of you, and we've shared some lively discussions, and I hope this afternoon's lecture will be eye-opening for all of you. One question I'm often asked is, do you think music can affect the establishment of world peace 
and change people's minds? My answer? Yes. Yes, I do. Well, now, please let me explain. Jazz has been the voice of freedom for millions of people for over a century. And jazz, without a doubt, defines cultural diplomacy. Jazz is a distinct American art form, yet is a potent and persuasive, universal and versatile language that has both incorporated and influenced global music. Jazz values diversity, encourages ethical and honest behavior, doesn't shy away from vulnerability, promotes innovative ideas, and insists one take responsibility for one's actions. Jazz inspires inner reflection as well as communal participation. And jazz has an engaging appeal. There's an element of the unknown in the music that mirrors real life. So it's never boring because the unexpected is just around the corner. The music creates and alleviates tension. And when performed live, jazz positively responds to its audience using intercultural dialogue to encourage and improve our communal existence, jazz musicians have always played an integral role and continue to be beacons in the storm, uplifting the human spirit. Serving as cultural ambassadors in small villages, on remote islands, at historic sites, and in noisy metropolises in all corners of the globe, the music exemplifies, encourages, and expresses exploration, courage, cooperation, respect, consideration, tolerance, self-awareness, and empowerment. With one solo instrument or an entire big band, jazz has the power to make people feel better and transform individual lives, families, communities, and societies. Jazz also has the an excellent sense of humor. Both jazz and humor are contagious and create a feeling of harmony with our neighbors. I don't think I could find a more perfect form of expression to promote the benefits and enrich the soul of cultural diplomacy than music. And since the term may be new to many of you, I'd like to explain what it means to me. Not only am I a musician, but I'm deeply interested in human beings. I have affection and curiosity for the unknown, people, places, ideas. And I'm engrossed with interweaving these passions together for the greater good. World change, it starts within. And what ultimately led me to open up my ability to recognize the idea of being a cultural ambassador was a shift in my self-perception. However, it was a few decades before I got to the point of extending the definition of my being beyond that of a musician. And in my case, it came through my practice of Nichiren Buddhism. But first, a little cultural diplomacy background and a few chapters from my personal history book that started the traje trajectory that was developing in my subconscious. What we play is life, so aptly said the great trumpet player and perhaps our very first cultural ambassador, Louis Armstrong, also known as Satchmo, which by the way, was a moniker given to him by Percy Brooks, the editor of Melody Maker magazine, when he accidentally abbreviated Armstrong's nickname Satchel Mouth into what's now the immortal Satchmo. I owe a debt of gratitude to my jazz ancestors, my heroes, who first ventured out into the world using jazz as a messenger, a friend, and a tool to make meaningful connections, sometimes uttered without a word of English. Other early builders, bridge builders, include the Beatles, visit to Russia during the Cold War, and the United States Information Agency's sponsorship of the family of man. 
a museum of modern art photographic ex exhibition depicting the full spectrum of the human experience from birth to death and traveled to 39 countries and exemplified peace and friendship. Louis Armstrong, along with Duke Ellington, Dave Brubeck, Benny Goodman, and Dizzy Gillespie, are only a few of the cultural diplomats who traveled the globe on behalf of the U.S. State Department between 1956 and the 70s to ameliorate the ideological antagonism at the height of the Cold War and to promote international friendship through the exchange of music. Complex political motives were involved. Most of the musicians were black. And while they were sent to respond to the perceptions of American racism, the reality at home was quite different. Dave Brubeck remarked, my quartet was one of the first jazz groups to participate in the U.S. State Department's People to People program. We understood, of course, that we played a role in Cold War diplomacy, but unfortunately, we were unaware of the part we played in the overall strategy. That's the end of the quote. Since those early days, the future of cultural diplomacy has been in good hands. Our planet's troubled present an uneasy future call for demand, peaceful approaches to soothe our differences. This is the essence of cultural diplomacy. And I'm pleased that under the auspices of the State Department and the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, I've been fortunate to embark on a number of successful international tours over the past 18 years. I'll tell you more about that a little later on, but for now, let's back things up a few decades. My first international experience was in 1963 when I was playing with Miles Davis at the Antibes Jazz Festival. Coincidentally, my good friend and one of my musical mentors, trumpeter Donald Byrd, was in Paris at the time. After my concert with Miles, I flew to Paris to meet Donald and he showed me the magical city of light, or La Ville Lumière. This was the trip that sowed the, the first seeds from my personal sense of global cultural relations. And what a time we had. <laughs> During this trip, Donald gave me a gift of something I'd never experienced. He uncovered and helped me discover a major city outside of North America where I was able to have an immersive experience in a culture that I only knew from music and movies. My appetite was instantly stimulated for the taste, sounds, and sights of the vast multicultural world outside of my door. And from that moment on, whenever and wherever I travel, my curiosity was ignited. I was compelled to inhale and experience the myriad lifestyles and traditions I encountered, and all of this fed my soul and my creativity. A second pivotal experience occurred in 1964 when Miles took the band to Asia as part of the World Jazz Festival, which was produced by George Wien, a prominent game-changing jazz impresario and founder of the Newport Jazz and Folk Festivals. I maintain a vivid memory of being on a U-shaped walking street in Japan with no curbs or sidewalks. It was the first time in my life where I didn't see one white or black face in the throngs of people crowding the street. Growing up in the Hyde Park Kenwood area of Chicago and attending Grinnell College, I was accustomed to being around white or mixed groups, but this felt unfamiliar, unusual, and was on my top 10 list of foundational embryonic experiences. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. Previously, I never thought about it. I subconsciously took it for granted that white people would be everywhere. 
And after this incident, I immediately began to question my, my thinking and feelings and unconscious presumptions. This was like finding the little needle in the haystack of global thinking, slowly examining an unconscious building block concerning connections, and perhaps even stimulating the development of future musical links. Remember, this was the first time I was in Asia. Also, in the 1960s, George Ween flew a group of jazz musicians from New York to Europe for several festivals, and the first, I believe, was in Paris. The plane was filled with jazz luminaries. Miles was there, Dizzy too, and the incomparable visionary Thelonious Monk, one of the most influential jazz pianists and composers of the 20th century. When Thelonious got off the plane with us, his close friend, pianist, and one of the founders of the bebop style, Bud Powell, met him at the airport. I watched carefully as Thelonious looked at Bud. And without saying one word to each other, they walked off hand in hand like two little kids. Their history and respect for each other was a thing of beauty and remains one of the most touching and outstanding highlights of my life. I also realized that jazz festivals were a model of cultural diplomacy and how incredibly significant these festivals were to creating the unification of disparate cultures. It was intriguing and infinitely satisfying to be a member of this club, a rare gathering of visionary and exceptional artists, joining their hearts and minds, fostering the creative process of, as Joe Cocker wrote in his tune, Space Cowboy, learning to live together. Although the idea of cultural diplomacy had been brewing in my heart and soul, waiting to be released, it was lurking in the subliminal shadows of my mind over the majority of my life in and out of jazz. Around the turn of the millennium, two things converged. One, in 2004, I was approached by a UNESCO representative who encouraged me to think about becoming a goodwill ambassador. However, it would be years before I stood before Irina Bokova, the director general of UNESCO, and accepted the position. Two, and of major significance, I began collaborating with my good friend and colleague, Tom Carter, who was also a creator of modern cultural diplomacy through jazz. He has been the president of the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz for almost three decades, and I've worked with Tom as a cultural ambassador for 19 years and now serve as chairman and professor. Tom Carter is with us today. Please stand up, Tom. <laughs> Along with Tom and the Institute students, I've been able to travel around the world and meet hundreds of thousands of people, soak up and familiarize myself with local customs, share my music and experiences, and thus strengthen and fortify relations with foreign countries. We've logged innumerable miles in the name of jazz and cultural diplomacy. And I'd like to tell you about a few outstanding tours I've taken with Tom and the students from the prestigious Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz Performance. For the past 19 years, the school has been educating a small select group of young international musicians who study tuition free for two years with the jazz masters in the tradition of the mentor apprentice model of jazz education. I've worked with and included many of our graduates in my bands. And I'm proud to say that the music is in really good hands. 
I always advise the students to consider the value of what their music project and behavior will send out to the rest of the world. I believe and try to convey that we must all participate in designing the human orchestra of life that will move humanity several steps forward rather than focus on creating a world that's greater for the few and worse for the many. In 1997, at the behest of President Bill Clinton and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who, by the way, <laughs> is a fledgling drummer, we took the students to perform at a cultural event at the Summit of the Americas. Several nations demonstrated the music of their country before 34 heads of state, and the very next day, President Clinton told me that our jazz group accomplished more for diplomatic relations than any of the other diplomats. And we also received the most enthusiastic response. It was more than the applause. I could actually feel and sense that the competitive spirit and barriers in the atmosphere subsided and disappeared. In 1994, and of considerable consequence to me, we were the first cultural organization to bring the therapeutic force of music to South Africa when Nelson Mandela became president after the end of apartheid. Jazz opened doors and helped heal a country that had suffered unfathomable hardships and pain. What finally made me and Tom Carter aware that we could have one special day a year dedicated to the celebration and appreciation of jazz as an international music, International Jazz Day, was the creation and implementation of UNESCO's annual World Philosophy Day in Paris. Now, jazz isn't verbally philosophical. However, philosophical ideas are beautifully expressed when you blend together the common language of music and the improvisatory principles that are fundamental in jazz with a visceral performance that conveys those ideas. We participated in Philosophy Day for three years between 2002 and 2004. After a concert and spirited roundtable discussion about philosophical concepts inherent in jazz with saxophonist Wayne Shorter, vocalist Diane Reeves and Dee Dee Bridgewater and myself, there was thunderous, enthusiastic feedback encouraging us to further explore the idea of a day dedicated to jazz. And less than 10 years later, we created International Jazz Day, which I'll tell you about a little later. Being selected by Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and President George Bush in 2005 to commemorate the resumption of diplomatic relations between the United States and Vietnam was a great honor. Beginning in January of that year, scholars, scientists, and businessmen participated in events to mark the occasion. In the fall, our group of students headed to Ho Chi Minh City for a performance, and then we traveled to Hanoi, where we celebrated Thanksgiving with Vietnamese and American citizens at the ambassador's residence. I heard that Secretary of State Rice said our tour accomplished more in 10 days than all the other events and programs achieved over the previous 10 months. The power of music, once again, proved it could unify and promote goodwill. During press interviews on a tour we took to Shanghai, I was specifically asked about my relationship with the brilliant pianist and China's most famous classical musician, Long Long, with whom I performed during 2008 and 2009. Our collaboration was an unusual blending of cultures, generations, and genres, 
and our connection was instantly familial. Challenging for me because I hadn't looked at a classical rep repertoire for nearly 50 years. But it was an, a sublime experience to revisit my classical roots. The best example illustrating our intercultural connection was a performance of the four-handed version of Maurice Ravel's La Deronette, or The Empress of the Pagodas, from Ma Mère Loi or Mother Goose. Empress of the Pagodas isn't designed to be strictly played with a metronome because there's a ebb and, and flow to the piece. And there are many places where the, the tempo can vary. It turned out that Long Long and I had a symbiotic interpretation of the piece, including the pauses, flow of time, and the dynamics, you know, the loud, soft, and silences between the notes. After playing the piece night after night, the magic began to unfold. So I'm going to show you a little video taken by Lang Lang's mother. <laughs> I'll show that a little later. Sitting on one bench, he took the lower part and the pedal. We began to breathe in sync. The pauses we made were exact. Our bodies swayed in unison. And our hand, hands sometimes, uh, his hands sometimes reached over mine and mine over his. This was kind of a lovely acrobatic. It was as though we were one and audiences went crazy. Here's our performance at the White House for a state dinner honoring President Hu Jintao. And we had a great time. <laughs> Yet another example of music being a universal unspoken language. President Hu remarked that even though our cultures and business practices differ, differ through experiences like our performance, the musical similarities of the two nations bring us closer together. When facing insurmountable issues, music unites, unifies. Other political leaders have used jazz as a bonding tool. Madeleine Albright is quoted as saying, as somebody who'd always studied diplomacy, I could see what jazz did during the Cold War. There was no question that Louis Armstrong and others going to the Soviet Union and other places had a real impact. To illustrate cooperation, she frequently used jazz as a tool throughout her service, often bringing world leaders to jazz clubs the evening before important discussions. You didn't know that, did you? She's a huge jazz fan, too. Jazz and other forms of music are also especially useful in conflict situations. Under South African apartheid, which, by the way, means the state of being apart. Protest music was an instrument of reconciliation. Did anybody see Searching for Sugar Man? Yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Great film, yeah. And this film won the best documentary Oscar in 2012. It's a film about uh, Rodriguez, an American rock and roll composer and guitar player whose song was not only a giant hit there, not in America, but became an anthem against apartheid in South Africa for, for roughly 20 years during the 1990s. He knew nothing about his impact until two filmmakers went searching for him and found him living in obscurity. President Lyndon Johnson quoted the song in 1965 when he called for legislation ensuring every citizen would have the right to vote. And Martin Luther King Jr. mentioned it in his Memphis speech a few days before he was assassinated. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. 
Such is the power of music. Every time I open a newspaper, I'm reminded that we live in a world where we can no longer afford not to know our neighbors, said my good friend, Yo-Yo Ma. So he did something. He has successfully established a Silk Road project that studies and promotes multicultural artistic exchanges and collaboration among artists, musicians, composers, audiences, and institutions. Inspired by the rich ethnic heritage and customs of the 4,000 mile long Silk Road that runs throughout the Asian continent, Yo-Yo is achieving his vision of connecting the world's neighborhoods. <laughs> now my phone rang and then just went to another thing on my screen. Distracted me. <laughs> and I'm the one that's running the uh, teleprompter, right? Through my iPhone. Yeah. So I had to, had to giggle at that. In 2008, the time had come for me to create and record another CD. And I wondered, why do this record? What would be its purpose? And ultimately, how could I constructively use music to benefit our globalized world? Many people have adopted a defeatist attitude that only a handful of powerful and wealthy individuals will profit from globalization. Those who feel, who feel that way believe they are completely powerless and dread the inevitability of a globalized world. And I, I understand those feelings. But I envision a global purpose that has the capacity to lead the world out of the darkness and into the light. It occurred to me that if we become actively involved in creating the kind of globalized world that we want to inhabit, we'll have the powerful advantage of intercultural dialogue. People with different customs and experiences can work collaboratively to create new possibilities in culture, education, and technological development. The goal will be to find solutions to many of our common global problems, some of which challenge the continued existence of life on the earth. Pete Seeger once said, my job is to show folks there's a lot of good music in this world. And if used right, it may help to save the planet. I wanted to find a way to use the power of music as a vehicle to highlight our interconnectedness in this positive light. And of course, this goes hand in hand with my own transformative realization of using my abilities to be of service to humanity. This reala realization motivated, energized, and inspired me to conceive and implement the Imagine Project. So in 2009, I traveled abroad to collaborate with nearly 50 musicians from various regions in the world beyond our shores, representing diverse cultures and traditions on a quest to demonstrate the advantages of globalization through music. At the heart of this action was a quest for peace that we all shared from the onset. Blending a broad musical vision with local musical culture, the project fulfilled every reason for me to make another record. It was a way for me to send a powerful message with an all-inclusive consensus of hope. In order to honor the musicians' diverse, fertile cultures, it was my intention to travel to their homelands, smell the air, taste the food, meet and explore the communities, experience their rich traditions. The reality of time and economic cir circumstances didn't allow me to travel to all the places, but I came pretty close. The title of the project came from the 1990, 1971 John Lennon song, Imagine, that's universally loved and sung around the world. 
has been the centerpiece for countless school assemblies, has garnered global airplay, and the lyrics basically ask the listener, why can't we all just get along? I felt this sentiment was an appropriate title and homage to what I strive to accomplish using the optimistic and encouraging forces of music. The Imagine Project turned out to be a monumental musical collage. And one of the songs of the CD, of course, is John Lennon's Imagine. and was built on a rhythm created by Konono No. 1, a Congolese group that plays thumb pianos and percussion instruments they craft from what they find in their local junkyards. There's also a lyric sung by Omo Sangare in Bambara, one of the primary native languages of Mali. And here's an, another. We travel to Ireland to record the times they are changing, the Bob Dylan anthem that weaves the Chora, played by Tumani Diabate, with a Celtic flute, fiddle, and Ilan pipes, Irish bagpipes, played by the chieftains, along with a few other instruments as well. And the lyrics were sung both in English and Irish by Lisa Hannigan. This was not the first time I traveled to connect and, and build musical bridges. Working outside of conventional jazz boundaries, my CD and accompanying documentary called Possibilities was an amalgamation among a diverse group of musicians. And this cooperative effort that sprang from our compassion for the people of the world rang out loud and clear, and it was gratifying to, to feel the music we made was in the spirit of service to humanity. We ended the documentary at the 2005 Youth World Peace Festival in Hiroshima that commemorated the 60th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Japan and the end of World War II, where saxophonist Wayne Shorter, guitarist Leonel Dueke, and I performed a, a completely improvised composition. You probably noticed that was Car Carlos Santana also at the beginning of, of this one. We were laying a wreath at the uh, uh, memorial at, uh, in Hiroshima. And this was a, a sobering experience for all of us uh, involved, remembering the results of man's inhumanity to his fellow men, women, and children. But the music we made that day celebrated peace, compassion, and friendship. This past November, I returned from an Asia, Asian concert tour and had the privilege of again visiting Hiroshima. And although I didn't win an award or receive a plaque, this experience stands equal to any accolade I've ever been given. Before I left my home in Los Angeles, I'd been notified that a middle-aged Japanese gentleman had, over the course of 15 years, lovingly restored four pianos that had been destroyed in the atomic bombing in Hiroshima. He was hoping I would play one and offer my comments. The arrangements for this meeting and an interview were made by the local press. And right before the um, main concert sound check, I was escorted into a, a different area. In the middle of the room was an upright piano, a seat, and the man who did the restorations, accompanied by a film news crew, the man explained his work, the history of the piano, and he asked me to play and then wanted me to describe the experience. I began to play a few notes. <laughs> wow, that piano had an amazing intensity. I was immensely captivated by its sound and felt overwhelmed with emotion. It was absolutely incredible to me that this piano was restored from the atomic bomb blast on Hiroshima in 1945. A few other people were in the room and one woman from a local city office 
had a copy of a piece of music I wrote in 1975 at the suggestion of a friend of mine that had been officially presented to the mayor's office in a formal ceremony. The piece was composed as an ode to the people who suffered, the 135,000 who lost their lives and their families who also suffered but survived. It also represented something beyond that. The composition is called For the City of Peace because my feeling was rather than memorialize the shock of the past, this occasion would honor and usher in the beginning of the spirit of peace toward the creation of a world without nuclear bombs capable of destroying humankind. It was given that particular title because I believed that the spirit of peace began after the bomb exploded. The woman from the city office handed me the music and asked me if I would play the piece for them over, over, uh, on the revitalized piano. It had been over 35 years, but as I began to play, I was grabbed by the indescribable sound of the piano, which had something very much alive and vital inside. I felt that the piano somehow represented the souls of all those lost lives being resurrected and reborn, like the phoenix rising from the ashes. Later, I began the concert and in the middle of the show played a solo piece. While I was playing, I couldn't stop thinking about that restored upright and what I felt that day. So I decided to kind of include a few excerpts from For the City of Peace. Right after I, I, I played that piece, a, a few days later, I got a, a, a letter from a friend of mine who read me an English transla translation of a letter to a local newspaper about my concert, written by a 68-year-old Japanese housewife from Hiroshima. So here's what, here's what the letter said. And, and the title was Healed by Mr. Hancock's Performance. On the 1st of November, I appreciated the special Herbie Hancock concert and was touched by the power of arts once again. From the first note when Mr. Hancock started to play his piano piece, a sound which never existed before started to flow. It was refreshing and filled with kindness and mercy. The concert hall quieted down after being filled with the intense sound. It made me feel like I was embraced by a grateful, tender, and innocent moonlight. The more I listened to his sound, the more it reminded me of a scene in my life. It's the image of my grandmother who died in an atomic bomb blast caught by the burning ruins of houses that were being destroyed. There were so many other people who were suffering from the ruins from the houses around her. I felt that they were freed from the heat and the suffering from Mr. Hancock's piano sound. The requiem, which is like my grief about my grandmother's death, which I couldn't erase, it couldn't erase from my mind for a long, long time, was disappearing. I left the hall with gifts from Mr. Hancock, which was high spirits and courage. It was like Mr. Hancock was appealing to us Let's build a peaceful world together. Now what stunned and amazed, me, and, and amazed me was that she had no idea that I was playing this piece that was for the city of peace. And hearing her words was an astonishing transcendental moment for me, a transcending moment. Her personal feelings of empathy 
mirrored the experience I had when I walked into the empty room, took a seat, and played that remarkable little upright piano. Is this not a great description of the power of music? I, mean, I, I, I was shocked beyond, beyond belief. It, it's through music that I've learned that there are an infinite number of nonviolent ways to look at and solve our differences. We have to build that vision to turn that possibility into a reality and embrace the knowledge and wisdom that the human spirit has the potential to design a peaceful world, a world we are proud to leave to our children. This lecture would be incomplete without a discussion of International Jazz Day, the musical crown jewel in fostering and strengthening communication and partnerships among disparate groups, a day that shines the spotlight on how much we all have in common and enhances the peacemaking process. An initiative that was a result of my first proposal to UNESCO as a goodwill ambassador. International Jazz Day is essentially a partnership between UNESCO, the UN, and the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, represented by Tom Carter. Held every April 30th, jazz is celebrated, studied, and performed around the world for 24 hours straight. It's an enormous, an enormous undertaking. a collaboration among jazz icons, scholars, musicians, dancers, actors, writers, and artists who embrace the beauty, spirit, and principles of jazz. All of us freely share experiences and performances in our big towns, our big cities, our small towns, across our seven continents. Last year, Every single country on the planet, that's 196 countries, including Syria, North Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, participated in Jazz Day. And we reached over 1 billion, yes. I said 1 billion people of diverse cultures, religions, nationalities, and ethnicities. I hope the Jazz Day would spread the joy of spontaneous creation that exists in the music and be recognized for its magnitude, social impact, and historic significance in global culture. And I'm so pleased to say that the response has far exceeded my wildest dreams. I hope all of you will participate in this year's celebration again on April 30th. That'll be held in Osaka, Japan. Here's a clip of one of my most favorite moments from last year's International Jazz Day concert held in our global host city of Istanbul, Turkey, in the Aya Irini, in the outer courtyard of the Topkapi Palace. And it features French violinist Jean-Luc Ponty, English guitarist John McLaughlin, and Indian tabla player Zakir Hussein performing Lotus Feet. As this lecture comes to a close, hopefully you've connected the dots in your own minds, and many of you may feel inclined to examine your own preconceived notions about the value of global collaboration among heterogeneous cultures. The terminology of cultural diplomacy is new, but the experience has been alive for well over a century. So please get involved and join me and my jazz family. There's room for all of you. <laughs> this isn't a quick fix, but it's a process that will evolve slowly and will be successful only by uniting our efforts. America is the largest immigrant country on the planet. That's us. And our roots reach out to every culture in the world. Globalization is here to stay. So together, let's think about the type 
of globalization we want and need. The most powerful weapon on earth is the human soul on fire, said Ferdinand Foch, a World War I French soldier and writer. So I sincerely hope after hearing my stories and ideas, you want to join forces and create an inferno with me and my fellow cultural dip diplomats. Thank you for being here. It's been an honor and a privilege. <laughs>